Uh, really happy to introduce Mark Rennie. Mark as a product manager and has worked at both startups and big corporates in the UK across sectors, including law enforcement, investment banking, cybersecurity, and more recently, business reliance and duty of care. You'll also find Mark hosting his own product podcast called Product Management Growth Through Failure, where he unpacks how failures and mistakes can lead to personal and professional growth and make you a better product manager. And Mark is also involved here quite a bit in our community and also participates here as a group leader as well for our London group. So really excited to get Mark engaged and involved in yet one more thing within the community. <laughs> <of our own. laughs> so I'm going to pass over to Mark. We'll get things started. Thanks, Scott. That was a fantastic introduction. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world, Thailand, Vancouver, a few places I saw popping up there. I really do appreciate you taking the time out of your day to join this session and listen to me. Uh, I recently asked my Twitter audience how many had worked in a, a B2B organization where leadership effectively just wanted them to deliver features that sales brought back from potential customers and uh, and sales conversations and every feature uh, an RFP mentions. And unsurprisingly to me, maybe surprising to some others, this was nearly 70% of the product managers that have worked or are working in, in this kind of way. And one of the biggest contributors that I actually see to this kind of is a failure to recognize that there is a disconnect between users, customer personas in B2B SaaS. And in today's session, I really want to unpack some of those differences, um, the problems with kind of focusing predominantly too much on a customer persona. And then ultimately, how do we build products that work for both, generates revenue, has high retention rates, and actually solves user problems, right? Um, but before we dive in, who am I? And that's an excellent question. And I'm sorry to ruin your day, but I'm not Iron Man. It ruins mine every time I, I realize it. But as Scott just said, my name is Mark Rennie. I'm a product manager. And six years ago, I was the guy that just tripped and fell into product. I didn't really know what, even what a SaaS product was back then. Um, and I was as fascinated and eager to learn back then as I am now. I've mainly worked in B2B, in startups and in major corporates here in the UK on fairly complex products, open source intelligence in law enforcement, investment banking, cybersecurity and now enabling businesses to be truly resilient by providing best-in-class duty of care. I'm really passionate about user experience as a product manager. I think that's a really important skill as product managers that we can have. And I'll often bore my colleagues and even my wife sometimes, look at her, on how the lines between B2B and B2C UX are increasingly blurry. I also host the podcast, and I'm actually really looking forward to talking to Scott really soon about all things community and also my CPO, Nick Wright, to tell us about his war wounds in product. So that's what's coming up soon on the podcast. Outside of work, just briefly, I'm a terribly average golfer. I'm also a lifelong Everton football club fan, and I also love boxing. I always say the only stupid question is the one that you don't ask, and therefore it remains unanswered. So please do fire questions in to the Q&A, and I really look forward to answering them at the end. For today's session, I thought a good baseline would just be to define what we mean by customers and users because in b2b SaaS, they're often used interchangeably but there can be some really important differences between these two terms so for the purpose of today's session when i reference the customer i'm talking about the buying persona the person that actually makes the decision to procure your software solution for their business for b2b products customers can obviously be users also but for today's session, I'm mainly focusing on products and scenarios where these two personas are different and they are separated. A user, they're the person that actually needs to use your product as part of their job. And they're the ones whose problem you're supposedly solving. Obviously, I'm being slightly facetious with the title of this slide. But in B2B SaaS, too much focus on your customer and not enough on your user can actually be a really big problem. And one of the reasons is that in B2B SaaS, and certainly at an enterprise level, there can often be quite a significant disconnect here between the users and the customers. And through my career, I've seen, and I can certainly even understand the temptation of the simplicity of just assuming that the customer represents the user. But in enterprise level corporates, this isn't really the case. 
And often the person that is responsible for buying your product, they're not a day-to-day -day user. They don't do the day-to-day -day job and they're going to rarely or never use the product. The customer's persona, they're responsible for that purchasing decision. And so they're likely guided by a fairly different set of motivations compared to the end user doing the day-to-day -day job. And whilst clearly there is a link between these two personas and they both have skin in the game, if you will, the disconnect at times can be quite severe and really important to recognize. What a customer persona often has, though, is one of or a combination of these factors. One is old knowledge from maybe when they actually did the day-to-day -day job. The other is base requirements. It needs to do A, B, and C. Often these kind of requirements are quite high level and they don't actually get to the heart of the problem sorry, that a user has and that you need to try and solve. And sometimes they might have a knowledge of other products in the space, competitors' products, either from use in the past or from maybe demos that they've seen from undertaking an evaluation of products in your area. And so what this often leads to is that you tick the high level feature boxes at a customer level but when they don't really truly understand the problem that your product needs to solve to benefit your end user when a user gets their hands on your product it leads to frustration it doesn't solve their problems and actually sometimes it can add to their workload so if you only solve a small part of a problem they might still have to do everything they did before and now use your product. So maybe there's double keying and that just causes huge frustration for users. What's the consequence of this? It leads to poor user retention, declining adoption in that user base as people start to talk about it not solving the problem. And ultimately, if you don't then solve those problems, it will lead to customer churn. And a, another really common scenario that sees way too much focus placed on customers is when the company chases deals and effectively builds every feature request that comes from customers and it treats RFPs like a, often the conversation happens at a customer level with almost the user forgotten about. And what then happens is that this often drives the dreaded feature factory where product job is basically to manage the delivery of all these custom feature requests. There's little product thinking done. There's very little discovery. And often it fails to address the real problem the user's having. This leads to a product that then resembles the burrow from Harry Potter, where features just get bolted on everywhere in the pursuit of these deals. And sometimes they're never won. And so the product then sits there collecting dust. There's no ROI on that feature. It's not used. There's no uptake. And it's a really expensive way to actually fail. Over time, this leads to a situation where you have a bag of features that when pulled together, it really actually struggles to hold together a product narrative. What's your product? What does it do? Who is it solving for? Again, this will lead to a situation where user frustration is high, adoption is low, and churn is high. Then sales are constantly chasing the next deal to replace the previous customer that just churned and to win that customer, you need to build A, B, and C, and X, Y, and Z. And guess what? You then end up in the vicious cycle of just going through the motions of building these and shipping these features that have low adoption, high churn, and the cycle keeps repeating. So yes, you might be winning deals. You might be generating revenue. However, at this point, you're not really a product company. You've become a solutions company, almost your customer's personal dev team that you just build whatever they ask for. In this scenario as well, it's important to recognize that the user almost becomes a, a product captive, whereby the company has bought the product, they're expected to use it, but it doesn't solve their problem. And until they shout enough about it not solving their problem, they get stuck using it. And the product narrative is totally lost and the user is forgotten. It actually becomes detrimental to your business because it's really difficult to then find product market fit and achieve the growth that comes with that. Now, don't get me wrong, a lot of companies go through this phase. It's fairly natural. But as a company actually looks to try and find that product market fit, saying no becomes really powerful. And I'm not necessarily talking about a product manager saying no. I'm more talking about 
recognizing that not every potential customer is your ideal customer. And this comes at a, an organizational level. And whilst revenue is important, if we are to avoid the feature factory driven by chasing revenue, it's equally important to recognize where that revenue is coming from. So having the ability at times and courage to say no to customers that aren't right for your product is actually really important. What that allows us to do as an organization and also within product is to actually deeply immerse ourselves in the target market, understand the customer persona, the user persona, and provide the best possible experience for those users and customers by solving those specific problems. Trying to please everyone just leads to diluted messaging, product features that don't actually align with the core value prop and have low adoption like we just touched on a second ago. And ultimately, it leads to low user satisfaction and low customer satisfaction. If we're actually selective about the customers that we serve, we can then better understand what problems we need to solve, how we tailor our messaging to target those customers and users, and then we have a better chance of finding product market fit. When you solve people's problems, it also leads to a more loyal customer base. There is higher satisfaction, retention is higher, churn is lower, and you start to find yourself in a much healthier cycle of delivering value. So saying no to customers in the short term, it might feel counterintuitive, but actually in the long run, it's essential in building a strong and sustainable product-led growth strategy where your product solves problems and delivers value for your business. And really, this kind of bleeds into the importance of a vision. It's very easy to say, just say no. But saying no becomes a lot easier when there's a strong product vision to hang your hat on. If, as a company, you don't actually have a clear vision, then what happens is this misalignment opens the door for what I call the can it just request. That then bleeds into basically building every feature request because can it just do this? Can it just do that? Can it just do this? And to win deals, you say yes. Now, when you have a clear and compelling product vision, that helps align the entire organization around that shared goal. It makes it easy to prioritize product features, make strategic decisions, and actually then communicate the value and the problem your product is solving for the users you actually want to solve for. And so as a product team, that helps us then move away from this just building sales requests and the RFP PRDs and actually investing in how we want to work as a product team in terms of discovery, understanding what problems to solve and delivering value that way. I'm not going to try and turn this into a, a personas masterclass because there's probably way more people that can do that better than me. But personas is a really useful exercise in understanding different wants, needs, problems of your users and customers. But firstly, the first exercise actually within what we're talking about here is realizing and accepting that if your user isn't your customer, you, you need separate personas. Once you have that, then you can actually start to understand these personas in, in a lot more depth. Having really well-defined personas can then actually help you tailor your messaging is it to your users? Is it to your customers? Because there will be different messaging that resonates and lands with the right personas. And remember, we are trying to build products here that works for both, that both ticks the boxes and solves the problems. So clearly, I'm saying there's a massive importance on users here. But how do we actually get closer to users to actually bring this qualitative and quantitative data in to understand more about? how we build the right product. Well, as my CPO put it to me the other day, and I think from a previous colleague of his, free is a great salesman. And so things like free trials and freemium models or a mix of both can be a really great way of getting touch points with your customers by finding a way in to understand their problem. So if we start with free trials, this can give multiple touch points through, through that point. But what it also does is it moves product to a point where they can engage quite early on in the sales process. It allows us to actually truly understand the needs of those users that are signing up for a free trial. 
and we can then look at what problems they're trying to solve do we actually meet that and actually from that it moves us away from the kind of feature name bingo that we might get at a customer level into actually understanding what are you trying to achieve by using our product as a product team it can also give us really fantastic quant and qual data insights we can gather data on how potential users are interacting with the product what features they use the most during that free trial and also any issues or shortcomings that they highlight that is an equally important data point to capture i think what this then does having touch points and gaining that feedback from your users at this point in the process is that ultimately, even if they don't buy the product, there is so much learning we can get from having a free trial and having an interaction with users. It's also useful to then see your conversion rate on the back of a free trial, because a low conversion rate would indicate that actually you're not solving the problems. And then again, you've then got a pool of users to actually speak to why, why didn't it quite solve your problem? What was it missing? And you then start to identify gaps within your product that actually, again, you might have ticked that box that it says you do A, but actually you don't do A1, A2, A3. And so that becomes a really great way of highlighting that. Freemium can almost, almost take this a step further. And it's a great way of pursuing a product-led growth strategy, which I touched on a couple of slides ago. Offering a, a basic free version of the product gives a lot of the same opportunities of free trial but over a much longer period of time and so when users start to self-serve and come on board and use your features that gives the same people insights as we might get from a free trial but extended over a period of time and actually over a period of time you might find that the data starts to say slightly different things Premium models are great also in establishing and growing your user base, giving you more people to actually talk to in discovery. And then that drives a positive cycle then, because the more people you can talk to, the more ideas you can validate and bring more data in to understand what problems you should be solving. So the other thing it also does, both on free trials and on freemium, is acts as a sales funnel of, of warm semi-qualified leads of people that are clearly interested in a product in your space. And so they're not a bad thing. They're a fantastic way for a product team getting access and also bringing leads in to the sales team. There are a few things to consider with free trials and freemium. They don't work for every product in the world. Otherwise, it would just be very simple to stick a, a sign up to free trial button on every SaaS product. But it's finding a balance. So on a free trial, what's the right length of trial for your user to find value? And then actually the next conversation is a positive one because they had enough time to explore. Equally, what's too long that they just stop using it or you kind of lose control of the process. The main challenge you find on freemium models is where do you put your breakpoints to push people into the paid models? Because then if you get that wrong, that obviously has commercial implications on your business that you aren't quite converting people into the sale into the sales plan again freemium are great whereas free trials are good in terms of looking at conversion rate the number of people moving between your tiers is a really great metric to measure here as well and so having built a pool of users and potential users what we can actually now embark on is a journey of continuous discovery to actually try and figure out what problems to solve that are going to solve our users' problems and deliver business value. Because ultimately, that's the goal of continuous discovery, to deliver products that our users love whilst delivering business value for our customers and our business. And I think one of the best ways is to find product market fit is through continuous discovery, because you are constantly in conversation with your users, understanding their problems at a depth that you don't get at a customer level. And also looking at desires or needs, and you're going to find those kind of desires through conversations. The world is an ever moving space and software is rapidly probably aiding that, but also is rapidly evolving. Just look at the uh, how AI and chat GPT has exploded this year and how the conversation is really centered around how AI is going to change pretty much every industry we won't go down that rabbit hole today but having conversations 
often with your users. It helps us understand that evolving market landscape and then also their evolving market needs. That then helps to identify us as a business, innovation areas. Identifying innovation areas is critically important to not become stagnant and get left behind. This is how you keep up with the market and keep solving problems as the goalposts move incrementally over time. So by constantly testing the assumptions, validating ideas through user research, experiments, feedback loops, all the things that are in continuous discovery habits, we can actually reduce the risk of actually what we're building. So now what we're doing is hopefully validating our ideas. We're prototyping, we're testing, we're iterating, and there's a much higher degree of confidence that we're going to solve a user's problem here. Investing in continuous discovery then does alongside things like free trials, freemium models, and actually bringing potential users into your product and also speaking to your existing user base is that hopefully through all those things, you start to solve end user problems. You start, as I've said a few times, picking the boxes and solving the problems. And so what you then grow is a pool of user evangelists. When you start to solve people's problems, they will evangelize your product internally upwards to that customer persona. And the customer can clearly see the ROI because the person that is meant to use the product is using the product. Nobody drops a product that they're happy with unless there's budgetary thing. But that means retention is high and churn is low. The pool of users is there to continuously carry on validating ideas with as well. They'll also evangelize externally to their peers in other companies. And what then this does is bring inbound leads and really leads to organic growth where people are talking positively about your product. People then want to use it. It also gives a fantastic pool of users that are really engaged with your product and they are more than happy to give valuable feedback because they like the feeling that they are help, helping to steer the direction and helping your product improve. And so they can help us validate ideas. They can help beta test new features and also they can help evangelize new features so that we can increase adoption when new features land. Investing in understanding our users' problems and actually cultivating a community of evangelists will help increase durability of your organization to find product market fit and therefore growth. But, and there is a, a little but here, we cannot forget about that customer persona. Like I've said, we have to build both. And so whilst I've clearly just placed a huge emphasis on solving your users' problems, and that does not diminish at all, we also really need to understand and not neglect the customer persona because ultimately they hold the purse strings. They're going to buy your product. And so we need to get close to a customer persona and we need to understand what their success criteria looks like. What ROI are they actually looking for the product? What problems are they trying to solve? Are they trying to increase efficiency, reduce costs? They'll also have a much deeper understanding than some of your users of where their business is headed, of what challenges or what opportunities they might foresee and what the market landscape looks for them as a business. Again, this is a huge opportunity if we actually understand that about where they're going, we can also start to think about where we might need to go to help serve those needs. And a great way to do this is again, getting early on in the process as a product manager and joining sales calls. Now, don't get me wrong, you don't have to go and sit on every single sales opportunity that your sales team are on, but sitting in on relatively well-qualified opportunities is a really great way to learn about your customer persona. But also after sale, if you've got a customer success team, they'll often be talking, building relationships ongoing and nurturing that relationship with the customer persona. That's where we'll find the market landscape insights that will help us feel around the innovation space and where we might head. So the ideal scenario, remember at the start, these two bubbles were detached somewhat, is that your product actually sits between your user and your customer and can almost be the glue that kind of brings them together in the activity that we're talking about that your product solves for. The long-term success of your product depends on how well it solves the problem for both your user and your customer. And that's why building for both is important. The user, as we've said throughout this, they're the ones that actually interact with your product. They use it all the time to actually help them do their job. And so they're going to be really important in whether your product is adopted 
and is therefore successful. And in order to do that, we need to go through the methods and methodologies I've just touched on of, of discovery and understanding their problems in, in a deep way. The customer, they're the ones that hold the purse strings, like we said. They're going to be evaluating the ROI. They're the ones when it comes to the renewal conversation that either they're going to say yes or no. And you can be relatively sure that if you actually invest in nurturing the relationship with both your users and your customers. Products that build for both tick the boxes and they solve problems. Now, there's also an opportunity, in my opinion, to build features that work for both. Now, <laughs> that might sound slightly counterintuitive to everything I've just been saying, but not every user is going to be a button pusher, but that doesn't mean that they can't have touch points with your product. And I call these offline touch points. And this is where as product managers, understanding your customer persona and what they're trying to achieve can be really important. Maybe they've received an Excel spreadsheet with the kind of data that your product is solving for. Now your product's there. If you can make things like ease of sharing reports and data from your user to your customer persona, really simple. If you can even maybe provide a route into your product for your customers to now access those reports, you might actually turn them into a user. But if they're not going to be a user, the offline touch point gives the ability to maybe put your brand in uh, on a branded report that then sits there and the ROI is almost in their face that they've got this report with your products brand all over it that clearly solves their problem for the numbers that they're looking at. The other thing here is the duality of a feature. How can the same feature work for both? And to use an example on one of the products that I work on, we use access control data to understand how many people on a site or an office at a given time, where they are on that site. And from a safety and security point of view, that's important to understand how many people are there. If something goes wrong, can we account for everybody? And that's a clear use case for our security end user. The customer persona can get so much value from that data because actually on the back of it is what we call time and attendance, where there's a lot of data of who is what there, how long are they there for, when are they there, and it could be as simple as being able to access that data to understand on a Monday, only 50 people come to the office, but your canteen is catering for 200. And so actually you can save costs by buying potatoes that will cater for on average 50 people and not 200. Then exploring the duality of that feature, this is where actually the conversion from a customer into a user might come. You might also uncover a new feature within the market that solves a problem across that customer base and it can grow your user base through bringing your customers into your product. One of the other things I think that can be incredibly useful for kind of closing the gap on users and customers is a public roadmap. And don't get me wrong, they're not right for every company and there's debates on public roadmaps, but what it can do is tie these users and customers together with the increased transparency that, that offers. It gives a real clear view of your direction of travel and it actually allows you to take your customers and your users on the journey with you. And it shows that you do actively listen to your customer and user community and trying to solve the problems. It's a really clear and concise way of actually communicating and signposting people to the company's direction of travel. And also it helps align the expectations across stakeholders and avoid the misalignment that leads to the can it just request? I've also found a public roadmap can be an interesting differentiator against competitors. If a company can see where you're going and can buy into the journey you're going on, that can be a really great selling point to just have that visibility. And so we come to the ultimate ideal scenario of B2B products, products that tick boxes and products that solve problems. Doing this allows you to get your foot in the door with the customer persona, but it also then allows you to have the depth of capability to truly solve a user's problems. This, as we talked about, leads to happy users. They gain value from the product. That means there's ROI for your customer persona on their investment in your product. This leads to high retention, low churn, and users evangelize your product, which can lead to organic growth. You'll also, as a product manager, have a pool of users to carry out 
discovery on, validate new ideas, define features, and align your strategy and vision, and ultimately find product market fit. But before I wrap up, I wanted to caveat pretty much everything I've said today uh, by recognizing that the real world isn't always quite as simple as these talks, books, and podcasts. And I know speaking to a lot of product managers that often there can be a fair level of imposter syndrome and anxiety that comes when you aren't working in the perfect way. Um, and what I want to say is that these methods are often aspirational. And as product managers, we have to at times pick and choose methodologies and frameworks and ways of working that will work and align with our current company's way of working and strategy and culture and all the things that we find on a day-to-day -day basis. But they are aspirational and they are inspirational. And change can absolutely be incremental and that's fine. Treat your product processes like a product themselves. Start small, iterate and continue to move the needle towards where you want to take your processes to actually work in what we what we read in these books, and presentations and podcasts the right way. So thank you all very much for listening to me today. Like I said at the start, I really do appreciate you taking the time out of your day to listen. Please feel free to connect with me on, on LinkedIn, follow me on Twitter. And if you want to hear interesting stories about growing through failure, um, please subscribe to the podcast, download it. There's some really interesting guests, like I said, and more to come. Um, I want to say a huge thank you to Product Board and Product Makers community and also to Scott for everything that he does for the community. And uh, I guess now, any questions? I'm going to jump maybe with my own question first, just to kick things off. We've got a few in here coming in though as well, but I want to hear maybe one of your failures or mistakes to pull from your podcast of a story, maybe where you got this, you know, user versus customer persona wrong, or maybe where you got it right and what you learned from it. Yeah, that's a great question. Having the, uh, having the podcast flipped on me. Like I said at the start, I was the guy that tripped and fell into product. And so pretty much everything I've learned has been on the job learning. I've done a few, but largely on the job training. And on my first organization, it was a startup that had recently been acquired and they stumbled upon something good within open source intelligence. But I think for a good period within that, certainly within my first year, we pretty much built every request that came in. And that's what I say. That's what I mean when I say we're naive to think that this doesn't happen. And at times it might be necessary, right? And it might be necessary to get your foot in the door. What happened next as a product person is then important to make sure you then form the connection with the user and actually start to solve their problem. And that will wash up. And ultimately, that's what happened over a period of time. At first, I just went, yeah, build. And I was the guy that took it. And I passed it to the developer. And they built it. And I said, it's ready. And I took it back. And I handed it to them. Over a period of time, I was only young when I got into product. I started to speak and go to more events and, and actually have contact with people. And kind of, huh, OK, we're, we're not quite going deep enough here. And then you start to look at the quant data as well and the fall off points and and, and, and your adoption might be low or retention, whatever the success metric it is that you're measuring there. And you kind of get these light bulb moments of, huh, oh, okay. And then it developed over time. And yeah, look, like I say, not every organization is going to be able to just jump straight in here. And sometimes it is necessary to just get the revenue ticking and, and win business. As product people, we then have to take it a step further and try and ensure it. I've absolutely done this. I've done it wrong my message is to try and even if your organization is still in that pattern try and make that connection to the user because over time you'll start to be able to influence the change yeah it's ultimately how you get better a question from campbell freeman can be difficult to pull off in more complex b2b products like those particularly require lots of configuration and such what are some of the approaches that you've used to address this and maybe there's a little bit of a follow-up question on that too afterwards i'll we'll ask you great question and I think it's fair to say I work in an organization where that is the case. Freemium is hard for us. We have a lot of configurations, a very complex product. 
I think, again, it's a bit of a journey as your product develops. Can you take it that way? And, and like it doesn't fit for everyone. And so evaluating that is absolutely right. But some methods really of looking at your users' problems, looking at your feature set, and is there any value that you could deliver as a free trial or freemium? It doesn't have to be the whole product. Again, that might not be the right approach without the context of understanding Campbell's product. But if you can, what it does is not only does it allow you to have people to play around and find the value with the product, for a product manager, it gives you that contact. So if you are in that kind of organization where you're kind of in that cycle of just chasing deals, if you can get a free trial, you can get that contact. No, it's not always right. It can be hard. But if you can just find a feature set that you can allow people to play around with. And, and look, not everything has to be the polished, finished, most perfect free trial sign up. There's lots of different ways of doing freemium or free trials where there might still be a bit of hacking together of the configs to get people set up, but they could still experience a free trial. So you have to look at what works for your organization, for your product. But yeah, just evaluate that. And then follow up to that from Campbell is some people might perceive essentially that free path as being risky given the competition could potentially use that to their advantage. How do you potentially mitigate that risk or avoid that challenge? Good question. I've seen it done in a few different ways as well. Sometimes gatekeeping, who's actually signing up for the free trial. So you do an element of validation of who it is and that there's an actual need there first before just opening the doors. And again, that kind of goes what I saying a second ago about it doesn't have to be the shiny yellow free trial button on the top and all of a sudden you're in. You can control it. I think a lot of companies sometimes right they sometimes not worry about the competitors copying i think if you're investing enough in your continuous discovery processes and actually validating your ideas and understanding where you're going and you have a strong vision you shouldn't necessarily be worried about your competitors seeing your features they're gonna see them uh, we always talk a lot here about you can always copy the what it's really hard to copy the why and that's your competitive advantage is really understanding that deep user need and customer problem that led to the solution you built. And while yeah. they might build something like it, in the end, it may not actually solve the problem in the same way or actually solve the problem in the same value. Yeah. I actually had a slide on in this on copying competitors and I took it out <laughs> and I couldn't have summed it up better, Scott. You might be able to copy the feature. You haven't understood any of the process or the journey that company went from to go from okay, this is a good idea to actually delivering that feature. How can you get feedback or talk to users, particularly when customers guard their time or kind of block you from engaging with them? And, and for a lot of companies, it's really challenging to get in front of the customer or in front of the user, even in that context, uh, depending on who you're trying to talk to. And so it's maybe some tips and advice that you've, you've seen on that side that's worked well. Yeah. Um, and, and that kind of goes back to the answer to the first question of I, in my first company was just, sheltered away building the request because I struggled at first to get that user access. I then started to go out and about on the floor of kind of conferences, which was a good way of chatting to people and, and creating your own conversations. Another one, I read a really interesting article, or in fact, it might've been in continuous discovery habits about how everybody actually has to be a user for you to go and speak to your kind of type of user. So you can go and speak to people that aren't your customers, that work in that space and understand and validate ideas there. But other ways, presumably most products will have user accounts with emails and whatnot. Reach out directly and say, hey, can we chat? Try and bypass the customer. Again, you kind of have to obviously be a little bit cautious and judge the situation. You don't want to cause any kind of uproar that you've gone directly there. Also another great way implementing kind of feedback in your products, which is going to get directly to them. So products that can capture user feedback in there and give you a data source, both qual and quant, you can then line up. So even if you can't have a direct conversation, you might get a, a mini survey in there that they can respond to or a text field that they can just type some thoughts. So surveys in product can be a great way of starting that process as well. Yeah, yeah, great.
Ryan, feel free to check out our sister product, Status Meter. It's a great product for exactly that kind of surveying. We do it in our own community. We do it in our product platform as well. And it's uh, it's been huge for us in terms of gaining that qualitative and quant side in a non-interactive way. And the last question here from Tosin, who's great to see. I know Tosin's going to be speaking at our upcoming uh, mini conference, but how do you avoid the public roadmap becoming your delivery plan? How do you just essentially just avoid that challenge, obviously, of maybe anchoring people in essentially a future direction that may or may not be coming true? Wow. Tosin's come with a big one, my <laughs> friend. That's a really good question. And I think whether your roadmap is public or oh. not, how do you avoid that is a great question. I think one is education, that roadmaps change, plans change, markets change. And so kind of caveating that. But I think certainly I've seen public roadmaps work the best when you have a strong user community, an engaged user community that kind of have an understanding of where you're going. And that's why I was saying on the public roadmap slide, you know, that transparency of kind of direction of travel um, kind of becomes really important. I think there's a level of detail that is always a, a careful line to tread with public roadmaps that you can overshare. And then I think when you do overshare, that's when you come into the danger of it becoming a delivery plan. I think capturing key themes or ideas is a really great place to start as you mature as a business and become established, you found product market fit maybe, then they can maybe become slightly more granular as well. And also the more kind of data you're pulling in the more discovery you're doing the more you're validating the things that have actually ended up on your roadmap hopefully you are going to do them and you've probably validated them to the extent where you're pretty comfortable that it's going to solve a problem because of the discovery and all the process that's gone into it actually going on that public roadmap so yeah i think that's my best answer to that cold on the spot yeah i'll put a link in here too for one of the sessions we did our recent product maker summit anna marie clifton I did a session on road mapping and particularly talked broadly about themes and also the concept of seasons in terms of presenting your work. So not really anchoring too much in specifics until you're closer to the point that you can actually provide that spe level of specificity. And so you see a lot of that in our own like product portal as well on our side, where we talk more in terms of problems or broad needs rather than maybe the specific thing we're going to go and deliver, which also avoids some of those questions and challenges too, when your roadmap needs to pivot or adjust course along the way. All right. Well, thank you, Mark. I think that was really interesting. A lot of great insights shared. I know a lot of people got a lot of value out of it. We had a lot of great questions. With that, I'm just going to wrap things up here. We've got a post-event survey that I have shared within the chat. We'd love to get your feedback. This is both valuable for us as well as for Mark. So please do take a moment and you could also win one of our monthly prizes. If you have other things you want to talk about on this, go ahead and open a conversation up in our community. We've got lots of events coming up next week. We've got Greg Bernstein joining us to talk about how research and product teams can work together. We've got a round table and a bunch of other events all the way booked up into October now, which is crazy. It's just going so fast with lots of different speakers. So feel free to check our full range of events. In particular, I mentioned the one that Tosin's speaking at at the end of May. Uh, this is our Supercharge Your Product Team mini conference. These are three days, two hours each day. So really easy for you to attend. Four speakers at each session. And lots of really great insights from how different product makers and product people are dealing with some of the challenging times that we're all operating within. And lastly, if you do want to speak or get involved, feel free to search for speak within our community. We'd love to have you much like Mark, share your expertise, your experience. There's no right or wrong here. Lots of great chances to share essentially how we're doing the different work that we do. So thank you everybody for joining us today. And we will see you hopefully next week at one of our events. Thank you again, Mark. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. See you. Bye-bye.